Hey, welcome to our Most Immortal Ad panel. Today I'm joined by Todd Wallen, Immortal Awards 2020 Chair, Deputy Executive Creative Director of AMV Video, and Double Immortal Award winner for his work with ST on Blood Norm and Viva La Volta. And I'm also joined by Paul Wayland, the legendary British director, writer, and producer who's made over 1,500 commercials, including 20 years of Walker's Gary Lindsay campaigns. Paul is the founder of Contagious London and has been awarded an OBE for services, advertising and the creative industries. So guys, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We can wait now. <laughs> We're here, uh, because Toby, you've selected The Guardian's Points of View, which was created by BMP in 1986, as your most immortal ad. And Paul, um, you're the director of what is now the iconic app. Um, guys, I guess we'll get struck straight into this with a nice, easy one. So, Toby, of all the ads that you could have chosen from, why did you pick Points of View as your most immortal? So, um, Guardian Points of View came out in 1986, so I would have been at 10 or 11 at the time. Um, and I think I remember seeing it then, um, but I'm, I'm not sure, you know, at that age, how big an impression it, it, it made on me. But then... Um, I was uh, I was studying at, uh, at college um, and like considering careers, um, and I came across it. And at the time, because I was studying uh, English, I was reading William Faulkner as I lay dying, and that's a, a, a novel where each chapter, so each character gets uh, gets their own chapter. So it's all about different points of view and the unreliability of of kind of one view of the world, one narrative point of view. And then I came across, in, in, in researching careers, I came across points of view, and, so, and I looked at it and said, that's, it, you know, whoever's made that, um, turns out it was Frank and John and Paul, they've done in 30 seconds what William Faulkner's sort of spent a novel doing. And I thought, if advertising can reach that height, so if you can kind of communicate an idea so precisely in such a short length of time, that is a career that I want to be involved in. And so I have a sort of personal connection to it. It, it was the ad that made me want to work in advertising. Um, so they, like, there's a personal connection there. And then when you look at it, and we'll probably come on to talk about it in the context of today's media environment and the kind of hyper-partisan culture, um, it kind of, it's, it's not just, doesn't just speak to me at a personal level. I think it's, it's kind of a universal truth that is as relevant and as immortal now um, as it was then, possibly even more so. Yeah. Paul, did you, I guess, Toby's obviously picked this as his most immortal ad and it's quite often cited as one of the best TV commercials that the UK has ever, ever made. Did you realise at the time that this was as perfect and as iconic as it would go on to be? Did you know it was a, as a hit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it was, again, you, um, getting some a commercial script that has that kind of intelligence attached to it is pretty rare, pretty rare. And I think that at the time, and again, it's really hard because you go back and you try and think, what, you know, how did I come to it? Why did they choose me? You know, because, again, it's quite weird that, you know, my whole reputation in advertising was comedy. And here I've got quite a serious ad. And I've got a feeling, you know, I had this long track record with John Webster when I first started in Avatar when I was just like, I think must have been about 18. Um, I got offered a job by John um, when I was first a junior copywriter. And I was also offered a job by Charles Sarchi and by a guy called Peter Mail at BVDO. And um, I went with the BBDO thing. And John Webster never got over it. But, and it was almost like I thought he was never really going to basically give me a commercial stew when I became a director. But he was kind of very supportive. And um, I think, and I can't remember the timing of it, but I also did, there was a guy called Alan Tilby, and I did a GLC ad for fire prevention, which was really graphic and, again, quite serious for me, which was a Sherman tank following a small girl in her bedroom or, or to her bedroom and it had a fire um it was like a fire coming out of the nozzle right a flamethrower thing 
and it was quite dramatic. And I think that maybe I think I, that was before I've been before, and I think that might have given them the idea that I could do that particular commercial. Um, and then, yeah, I obviously really wanted to do it, and um, so did quite a few other people, as is the case. And I was then awarded the job, and the weekend following being awarded the job, someone at Park Village, I can't remember who the director was, went out and directed the commercial himself for free. Made, really? Yeah, absolutely right. made the commercial. It was probably not very good, but I never get to, I never got to see it. But that's, I think it was almost like, yeah, you knew it was a special one. But I didn't realise at the time, you know, that it would actually almost kind of change your destiny. You know, it was a destiny changing spot, really. Um, yeah. And that's why we're, and it's amazing that we're still talking about it 35 years after making it. So yeah. maybe I should have stopped my career then. What was, um, was, it, was the, uh... Was the script sort of perfectly polished as it arrives? Um, it was, I think, again, and again, I, I vaguely remember it was a campaign. And right. I think that there were some ads before it, but I think, I don't know whether they were animation or whatever, but I definitely know that it was one of a campaign. And this, yeah, this one just got sprinkled with the magic dust, you know, that's all I was saying. And it's like, yeah, it's, really brilliant piece of communication in that short space of time. I mean, I don't yeah. think any commercial, you know, and it, again, it's quite a difficult one because it then set up quite a few issues with as, as far as awards were concerned, but we can get onto that in a minute. When, so. How, so how did, I mean, it, you, you, you make it, it comes out. How, how did it fare at the time? Like, do you remember what the Guardian thought of the whole thing? Um, well, the weirdest thing about this one is that directly after making it, I made it, I think we finished it, and then I went off to Hollywood. So I literally was not around for any of the reaction, and then I made a movie a year, for a year in Hollywood, and so I wasn't aware. So at the awards thing and whatever, I was never, yeah, I don't know. But the whole scandal became when they basically it was one of the most popular ads and has gone on to prove that but dnad the jury never gave it a black pencil really yeah and this is the weirdest thing so after that event and this was so you know like i don't know if you've sat on dnad juries but they were so political you know the minute mm -hmm. You know, a BMP ad came up. All the CDP people would be like pushing the this, the X button. You know, not the yeah, yeah. There was a lot of, and a lot of people in the juries were people that had work there that they thought was more worthy. And you know, so the politics were really odd. But after that, it was almost like because that never won a black pencil, things were never awarded black pencils because they said, well, if the Guardian can't win a black pencil, then what is worthy of a black pencil? So, well, yeah. so we could all be we could all be enjoying black pencils you know, if it wasn't for the Guardian. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, it kind of, and you know that in a way was the stupidity because you know again DNAD can sometimes you know it's a great organisation but it can also be slightly up itself at that time and what and I thought that uh, you know again it's like the Olympics if someone wins they win a gold medal right they don't if they don't beat the world record they still win a gold medal. But advertising seems yeah. to be slightly above that. It's yeah. So yeah. you've inadvertently set the bar high yeah. by mistake for everyone. Not by impossibly, mistake. impossibly, yeah. stratospherically high. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, and again, it was really funny because there was, I think, about two years ago, the Epicure is it Epicure like European Awards? They they gave Guardian their top award and then re awarded it, and that was the first time that I'd actually picked up an award for that commercial personally. So it's almost like, yeah, it's a good haunting for me because I've come back and I love to win awards. You know, yeah. so it's great to keep coming back after thirty five years, still winning for the same bloody ad. Bring it on, bring it on. Yeah. Only I don't get any work from it, which is a bit boring. Um, <laughs> well, where does, where does this sit as for you as your sort of body? Does it must be right up there as one of, one of your possible best or personal favourites? 
Well, in a way, it has to be because, it, you know, again, it's so universally, this is the weird thing, it's so universally applauded. Like, so when they do that A-list thing, like, for, I think probably for like 15 years, it was the pick of everyone. Obviously, as it gets older, you know, it's, you know, it falls from people's memories or whatever. And then things like Guinness Serpent comes along, which is obviously so visual and out there and beautifully done yeah but i think you know it's yeah as i said you know it's so weird that i did 1500 commercials yeah i've got quite you know i would you could say you've got 10 that you think are up there as your all-time favorites but that one probably you would have to say although it's really odd because i do comedy i probably say well you know water in Yorker the Heineken ad would probably be my favorite or lip sync and, you know, a lot of Hamlets and whatever, but for, a, you know, a, something that communicates so beautifully, that would be yeah, my favorite all time ad that I personally been involved in. And can I just ask from, a, from the, the way it was, was shot, why was it done in black and white? Well, I found this today because, the, the, you know, nothing is original in anything. Right, so I want to show you the inspiration for this. And he's now become a friend of mine. He lives locally here in um, Somerset. So I'm going to show you, this is the inspiration. For Can you see that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Don McCullen. And look, even the woman in the, um, in the doorway there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, reportage. And that was the kind of feel that we wanted the commercial to have. And obviously, because it was for a newspaper, you know, well, they weren't colour in those days. It was all black and white and news photography and gritty. And so black and white felt very, very natural and a, an easy choice. Um, and yeah, so you can ask me more. There's any more stories to tell. Yeah. Keep talking. I think that, yeah, the, I mean, obviously the extension of, the black and white aesthetic of the paper and the reportage. I mean, that really comes across. The, the, thing, the thing that really surprised me is, um, I, I guess because it made such a big impression on me, I just remember, I was, I was amazed to find out that it was only, or rediscover that it was only 30 seconds. Yeah. Because I think, I think you, you fill in the story and the backstory and, and all the rest of it. And because because it's such a powerful idea and because it's got the three shots and the three points of view and the three different stages of the story, you, you kind of, you fill out the rest of it in your head. I thought it was like a 60 or a 90. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's, the, it's the concision and the, and the precision that, um, that when you come back to it is, uh, is astonishing. Yeah. And obviously it was the time of skinheads, but even the skinhead doesn't look, dated now the what the thing that looks most dated is the guy in the trilby it's quite funny yeah. to see page you wouldn't have the bloke with a trilby on yeah, yeah. that is the only almost like the skin edge you kind of still see him around don't you i mean i was in yeah, my yeah. Park the other day and there was one with a whole plume going on um but yeah and there's another little um thing the woman in the doorway is actually kathy burke yeah yeah, yeah. So i read about that yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, and again, I, so basically on the day, this is so Webster was pretty prescriptive as um, as a creative, you know, and he was very clever, but he could also be, you know, pretty prescriptive. And he was fixated on this being looked like it was one shot, that we weren't manipulating the images at all by editing. And he had this in his head. Mm -hmm. And of course, to get the job, I went along with it. But at that time, because right, you do that a bit, you know, you tell the creator, oh, yeah, yeah, smile. And then on the day, you think you're going to do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so basically what, what happened is that we turn up and he says, you know, I want all the cameras rolling at the same time, the three cameras. So we did have three cameras. And what soon became obvious is that I couldn't place the cameras out of shot and st and make a dramatic commercial and in those days obviously there was no painting out of anything these days you could do it you just put the camera in shot and paint it out afterwards and put the placement back in or whatever and i couldn't do that and he became very disappointed by the fact 
the I couldn't do it. And I kept on saying to him, but you know, it should be, we should go for powerful shots, not keep something very loose. Otherwise the middle shot would have been very wide and you just yeah, yeah, yeah. the drama. So there was a little bit of aggro on the shoe between the two of us. And you know, well, you said you could, and I said, but I, c I can't. And um, yeah, it got a little heated, but in the end we, we um, yeah, History said, you know, no one knows that there's a cut in there. You know, no one's looking at that. We would have known that it was three cameras running at the same time, but who else would have even thought yeah. of it? So it's, it's an interesting thing because you, you can't, can't, you go into a shoot with, you know, if you've had an idea, you know, as a, as a creative, you, know, you go in and, and, and you, you think that that idea is so sort of all, all enveloping, if you like, that it's the, it's the silver bullet and then, it, and therefore it should, everything should hang off it and you've got a fixed idea about therefore how the idea should inform the, the way the thing, the thing is made, be yeah. it, you know, three cameras or be it, oh, it's all got to be totally UGC and all the rest of it. And that's why you have to, you know, the, the director's job is to put it on screen in the most compelling way. And, you yeah. know, and you can trust that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and this is the thing, you know, for decades, forever, you know, there's always been, you know, in certain points when directors get a, a relationship with a creative team and there's a trust that builds up and there's continuity. And this is always what I used to bang on about because I wanted repeat business. No, but, but basically that is what you, but the problem is creators were always so like quick to run on, to go on to the next person because agencies, it, it's just, a, unfortunately it's like a ego thing. And, they have to have the ownership. Do you know what I mean? And if they work with the same director, like, so if you give the, everything to Jonathan Glazer, is it going to look like it's Jonathan Glazer? But in the end, historically, everyone benefits. That's my thing. And, um, but that's my little speech. Yeah. So, yeah it's, um, I, I just think that, and I work with John quite a bit. And, you know, in the end, he was the one that gave me the first Walkers ad as well, John Webster. Yeah, and yeah. then what then happened is I did them and they were quite successful, and then he sent me a script that was that I didn't get back to him immediately on, and he got hurt. His feelings were hurt, and he gave the job. He took the job away from me and gave it to one of my other directors in the company. It's kind of you know the, that's what I'm saying. That's what all you're dealing with. You think, yeah. oh, over the years, there's always that, but like, ultimately, you know, it's the way it is, and yeah. Yeah. So now I was just going to ask. So obviously Frank went on to direct. Frank yeah. Hudgen went on to direct. But did he have a? Did he have plenty of points of view as well on how it should be directed? Do you know what? I can't even remember Frank on the show. Oh, right. That's the honest truth. I remember John, and I'm sure Frank was there. But you know, and again, you know, because I started Frank off as a director. He came to my company originally. Yeah. And worked with us for about eight years, did all these great work, a lot of great work. So I was very proud of that, you know, spotting him. Because he was not the most obvious of directors. He was so indecisive. But he did really turn out to be pretty much, I don't use this word lightly, a genius in advertising. Mm -hmm. He was just saw things in a way that no one else saw them. But again, he would have been the art director on it. And I think when people work with Webster they became like second to Webster. Webster was so strong, you know, and um, I think that, I, I, yeah, so I don't really have, but obviously, you know, I did build up a relationship with Frank, went on to make other commercials with him while he was at BMP, but I can't, no, I have no recall of Frank on the shoot, just John really, right. in my ear. <laughs> I was going to add that the, Toby mentioned this in his write-up and at the start that it says, obviously, it's one story with three different perspectives. So you're kind of saying three stories in 30 seconds. Was it always going to be a 30 or going to make a longer cut? I think the director's 45 or 60. Um, I think originally, I seem to remember that there was some more drama, but we thought it was over eggs. So Kathy Burke had a child on the street. There was a baby, a little girl that she dragged out the way to get her out the way of the skinhead running. Right. Um, and that ended up being edited out. Um, but I've got to, well, 
Was it originally a 40? I don't know. In those days, there were... I don't know if there were 40s in those days. I think there were 30s and 60s. I'm not sure. I think 40s came in later. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but... So, um, yeah, and it just... I can't, I, don't, I can't remember who did the voiceover, but the voiceover is just so perfect. And it's weird, you know, an event scene from one point. Of view, one of yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one, but it's only when you get the whole picture that you can really understand what's going on. It's almost like, yeah, it's like a kind of a weird poetry, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like a, a chant. It's a, yeah, it's got a sort of cadence to it. Yeah, because these um, days, what they would do, they'd have a, yeah, an event scene from one point of view. They, <laughs> they, it wouldn't be a posh voiceover, would it? Yeah. It wouldn't be like that. And that... For some reason, that old-fashioned voiceover that we all used to use all the time just works so brilliantly with it. Yeah, it definitely makes it, keeps its timelessness. Yeah. Uh, but then even like dis decisions about not to, uh, you know, you, you don't say, you know, you don't voice or sort of write an end line, like see the whole picture. You know, yeah. it's, it's there within the voiceover. Yeah. You know, and then it's just the Guardian logo. And it, like there's a, you know, all, all the kind of extraneous stuff that kind of quite often lumbers, um, lumbers its way onto ads, you know, is, is, is stripped away and he sort of kept it, kept it pure. Yeah, um, yeah. Which was part of the thing in those days. We were very, you know, again, it was so great being in, in advertising then. It really was. <laughs> you know, we would sometimes do commercials with no VO at all. Yeah, like uh, it was, and yeah, and now these days it's like someone would have said, but you've got to mention the Guardian in the first three seconds because in research, yeah. and this is the trouble, you know, if we would have been in the system that you have to do ads by now, we wouldn't be having this conversation now, would we? Yeah, well, you don't have an ad. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, if you if you've given away the, the brand, the brand is your. Is in in this one is the, is the answer to the yeah. the story you set up. It's the natural conclusion to the story. So like if you put your brand up front, people would know that then something you know something would be coming about you know and an ed editorial point of view or a, or a take on the world. And there'd be yeah, no but, in, but even in those days, you would have like Unilever or whoever you know would have their little logo in the corner that was also <laughs> the negotiation that the agency would make with the client all right we're not going to mention the brand immediately but they could have their logo in the corner but the guardian you know they were pretty cool about yeah. it and they ended up with and again it's it's just um perfect for the guardian at that particular time whether it's true now i don't know you know mm. It was look. This is something that was made in in '86, and like we said at the start, 34 years later, and we're here talking about it now. Um, a few years ago, we had the Guardian Three Little Pigs reboot, which kind of tapped into the same creative idea um, of the whole story. How how proud are you to have been part of a creative idea that's still going strong over 30 years later? Um. Yeah, you know, I think that what what I'm the most proud about with this ad is almost like the it's Toby's inspiration for coming into advertising. And you know, in a, in my career, you know, I'm going to start. If I had a drum, I would start beating it now. There's been a few times where people have said that to me. You know, when I was a copywriter, I did um, a commercial for Fiat Strada, which was the first two minute commercial, hand built by robots. Do you remember? You probably a bit younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Toby might. I did not. Well, yeah, I do. Yeah. And the amount of people that came up to me and saw that and went and wanted to go into advertising, you know, the Heineken ads, the Hamlet ads, and you just go, wow. So you've almost like done your job, really, if you've, yeah, if you've inspired people. And then with the Guardian commercial, that went even a step further because it came back like the police used it as a training tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, not to second guess, you know, and what's going on with now with Black Lives Matter, you know, in the end, maybe those police forces should be watching that ad before they pull out their guns, do you know what I mean? Just to make sure what they're doing, obviously they're not doing the right thing. Um, and also, my, when my kids were at school, it was one of the A-level questions in art. Really? Yeah. yeah, they had to do, they showed them the commercial and then they had to do a piece of art that, 
represented three points of view of something. So, you know, and that when your kid's doing that in his exam and he said, oh, look, Tally, didn't you do that ad? Yeah, you go, all right, this is pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's, it's I mean, it, for me, it's like, obviously it was perfect for The Guardian at the time and still is. It was a beautifully made, like we said, sort of, you know, like a perfect like, model of concision. But it's also, I mean, it was kind of a purposeful piece of communication before kind of purpose had been, you know, had, had become sort of mainstream. You know, it spoke to a higher human truth. Yeah. You know, that kind of, so it didn't, it didn't feel like, an ad it felt like a sort of a commentary on you know how we view the world and the human condition and our you know our willingness to sort of be misled or, or kind yeah. of um and you know which is why it's using police training videos and all the rest of it and i think it's it's a combination of all those three things it's like the it's a beautiful story and it's crafted but it also it just sort of appeals to sort of a, you know a higher order i think yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of what's a shame, and you know, obviously John Webster is now gone, and so is Frank Budgeon. And you know, again, I don't really remember ever sitting down with them and asking them where the idea came from, because it is a pretty bloody smart idea, you know. So really, there I would say, you know, normally I'm, I would I would want to grab, but I would say that it's down to the creatives on that one to actually, yeah, come up with a concept like that. For that paper, which is so perfect and so succinct and so on it, all I had to do as a director was deliver the message in the most dramatic way. So I think you know, as much as it hates me to give other people credit, no, I'm joking. But I literally think you know they they the creative team on that, you know, that's the thing. It's all about the script. It's all about the ideas. And these days, you know, people write kind of vague ideas and the director has to go away and interpret it in a visual way and bring stuff to it that makes it really look a lot more interesting than maybe it is. That's the device now, isn't it? Where there, what, you know, where, what the word I would use is that we will use a lot to perfume a pig or polish a turd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when you get a decent script, um, yeah. And in my whole, you know, when I went on to do movies, you know, and it, again, that was frustrating because trying to find the right material with her only once in all the times in my kind of 40 years of being a director, something landed on my desk and I thought, oh, my God, I have to do this movie. It was an open directing assignment. I want to do this movie. I find him out. I said I literally would do it for free. It was a Spielberg project and it was American Beauty. And that was, and then obviously Sam Mendes got it. He went on to become a major star, deservedly so. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. I couldn't get it because he was out there and a theatre director. But it was the first thing you read and go, "Oh my god, I can see it! I want to do it! I've got to do this!" And that's a bit like the Guardian. You think, Jesus, that doesn't land on your lap. Yeah, maybe once or twice in a career. Yeah, thinking about the going back to the commentary and the purpose driven point of it um if we were to lift it from 1986 and put it into this culture where you know the fake news disinformation is being spread so quickly on social media um it's could it run today and should it run today as is well interestingly um about two years ago, I got seriously dicked around by a very good creative director who they, I can't remember who the agency are, who had The Guardian. And The Guardian wanted to run the commercial again, but remake it. And they wanted it for their new digital version, like they're basically on your phone that you can use as it comes in. So you're getting the whole story. And yeah, it went backwards and forwards and they booked me and they canceled me and they booked me and it never happened. But the script that it was, and what they wanted to do, again, make it more of a media. The reason why they came back to the original director is because they wanted to do something like this. They wanted to do a whole story with the director that did the original and it was going to be a whole online thing. So it was a 360 degree of me with the original commercial and here I was being filmed doing 
the updated version. <laughs> but the scripts I saw were not particularly good. My feeling is that they should have just run, you know, basically run our commercial, but maybe then insert, inserted it with characters from now. Do you know what I mean? So almost like do, but then you have to rely on people knowing what the ad was in the first place. But then what you should do is just run that ad again. It would be interesting to run that ad again now and see what response you get to it. Mm. But you know, it could run as a, it could run as an Instagram story where you kind of, you've got one chapter, you tap, you know, then you see the next one, then you see the next one. It's like, yeah. you know, there are so many different formats now that didn't exist at the time. Yeah. But, you know, the, actually, because the story is, is so potent in and of itself that you could probably deploy it, you know, in some of these new formats yeah. um, and that kind of thing. I definitely think, yeah, the guard and why the Guardian never run it is quite weird. Isn't it? They just don't have the budget, I suppose. They can't. Something that came up um, last year in the jury room, and something that I talked to the guys about on the last episode was that it's insanely difficult for a commercial to stand out anymore on its own. Um, it has to be of such a high level and you know, campaigns and purpose and um, a, a social good sort of stuff now. Um, but we're here talking about an ad that's over 30 years old and saying how relevant and timeless and essentially immortal it is. So I guess maybe, Toby, do you think this would win today? Yeah, I think it would. Um, you know, I'd, uh, and you'd hope it got a black pencil as well. Yeah, uh, uh, I, th I think it's, you know, it, it's such a little gem. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not a big sweeping epic, but it's, it's, it feels so much bigger than it's, it's 30 seconds. It feels like it's a longer story because you fill it in. It feels like it lands a cultural point that is far beyond kind of just selling the newspaper. So, yeah. you know, it just packs, it just punches well above its weight. And I think, you know, when you were in a room, um, you, would, you would understand that's power when you're in a jury room or, or whatever, you would understand that power. Um, yeah. And yes, you know, people would have spent more on a, on a bigger piece or they would have done a campaign you know, what I'd love to see is it up against uh, the New York Times, Truth is Worth It, you know, and you kind of go, there's one 30-second spot here for The Guardian versus a campaign of, I think, I think they did about seven, seven spots with the typography coming on and off. Um, all of those, um, you know, picking on different, different storylines um, and actually just have a discussion about the, the relative merits of the two because um, they, they're they're both interesting but i think what for me what this has is it's a point about the human condition it's about how we how we view and relate to other people um and the stories we tell ourselves whereas mm -hmm. the truth is what the truth is worth it is a story very much about journalistic integrity um and perseverance so it's kind of tighter in on the industry um and on, on journalism whereas this is i think more universal yeah, it's thoughtful, it's intelligent, and it's questioning. So basically, you look at it and you question yourself, and what yeah. more can you get? And that's the and the genius is it's done in thirty seconds. Yeah, so it's almost like a yeah, it's it's magic, it's magic in a way, and you don't really get that in in a lot of advertising now because there's so much strategy and so many people. You know, it's just pure, it's just simple. When things are stripped away, okay, so what is this really about? And, you know, people listen, clients listen to the creative, good creative with a, a clear, simple thought. That's what works. And advertising now, you know, you say people aren't watching them. All right, yeah, obviously with social media and what's going on there and the attention span and they're not watching TV programs for very long. But... Is it gonna? How long will it be before you know Netflix and Amazon start putting ads? So I don't know. You know, you just don't know. So maybe ads could come back. But the reason why there's some people so anti ads is because we've stopped entertaining and we've stopped informing. You know, because what we what happens is we're jamming things down people's throats. And people, I don't know what you feel, Toby, but people just aren't don't want to be sold to. People want people want to be entertained. It, you know, there's yeah. still things happening, but 
there's there's just less of them. There's just less of them, and it's harder to probably get through, isn't it? It's harder to get through. And to be honest, I think to your point, um, Paul, that you know the 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 awards industry is configured in such a way to to reward. It's easier to win in in innovative media because you know that's where the heat is. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so, and, and also because, because if it's, if it's a new media or a new format, then obviously there's less things that have been done there before. So it's easier to be original in those yeah. spaces. Um, uh, so yeah, there's, there's this kind of the public kind of resistance to ads, but there's also a kind of our own industry kind of chasing the new, um, and forgetting, uh, you know, the power of the 30 second spot. Yeah. But, and, but yeah, as I said, I, you know, I was in the industry for 40 years and I saw everything and I saw it, you know, change. I saw, you know, the whole thing about the Empress new clothes, you know, where things became, where there was much, you know, the visual narrative became really important, you know, to look more important than the, than you actually were because yeah, because directors and, Asia became like, as I said, like magicians in making imagery that, wow, look at that. But ultimately, then everyone starts doing it. And when you start doing it for Volvo and they do have a story and then, you know, pal, the dog food people are doing it as well. It slightly begins to like, really? You know, so that's what I'm saying. There's a time and a place and a product for everything. But the minute, and that's what advertising does and everything does, you know, everyone jumped on the bandwagon, but in a lot of the cases, it's not appropriate. And that's yeah. in my opinion. And, you know, I think that's kind of what happens, but you know, your thing with, um, I looked at your blood, what not, is it called blood simple? No, the blood normal. Yeah. Blood I, would, I would have, I would have, uh, I would claim credit for blood simple as well, but the, the Cohen brothers. Might, oh yeah. Yeah. That's uh, the Cohen brothers, you know, and my son works at some such and he knows the director on that. And you can see, you know, it's like really interesting because again, it's thoughtful. Yeah. It's you, you get into the people and it is a new way of advertising and you, because it's almost like you're not selling anything. You're just selling freedom. You're selling, you know, you can yeah, yeah. come and go and you're, you know, and there's no taboo. There's no taboo. And especially like the bit where you can't show the blood because the BACC or whatever they're called now. I don't yeah, know. yeah, 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 yeah. Us, yeah, yeah, yeah. That they won't let you show it. And I thought that was a genius way of saying they won't let you, you can't show this. And you, yeah. we, were always, we were always into stuffing them as much as we could, you know, like um, – putting things in that they just didn't understand, you know, their kind of copy clearance committees. I remember we did on the high water in Mallorca where the guy offers her a drink. He says, get your laughing gear around that, which is obviously, yeah, 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 we got away. And like, it was always, we always used to go dance on the spot. We pull one over their eyes because they don't really understand what that means on the street. And it was, yeah, it was always yeah. a game. And that, was, that made it fun as well, you know, seeing what you could actually yeah. get away with. But obviously it all got stricter and stricter. And then the type that you have to, with all the disclaimers. And so basically you can't even see the ads anymore. There's so many disclaimers on the screen. So guys, um, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you both had fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I did. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, nice to meet you. Good luck. Bye. Bye. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on.